We're ready to go to work. Let me get my notes out here. Let me catch up with you. <laughs> We're going to try to cover some 236 facts this session. And if we don't, we're going to, as I mentioned before, cover what we can. We're going to begin by dealing with the first subject, which is the African origin of the Bible. It's a very important subject to us because black people, especially in this country, are very attuned into the Bible. They feel a special attachment to an affinity for it. And as a result of that, when many of us were coming to the light of understanding of a knowledge of self in the 60s and 70s, we thought of the Bible as being a white man's book and so we rejected it because it had been manipulated against us in many ways. And, and it had. But you didn't have to reject it because it is yours. And the object here today is to show historically that that is so, to document that fact. You've heard us say it before. Many of the references and documents I'm going to be using you may have read before at some time in Dr. Ben and uh, Diop and Jackson and a host of others. But perhaps you had not viewed them in this context. So we're going to be, as you can see, I got part of my library. I wasn't able to bring the whole thing. There's over a thousand books in there. If I could have, I would have brought it all. <laughs> we'd just come in and camp for a week or two and go through the material. So I brought what I did. We will be working out of them. I will be doing the commentary on them. On the first subject, the African origin of the Bible, lesson one, the question comes to mind, who wrote the Bible? Question I've heard all ever since childhood. I'm going to answer that with several documents. And I'm going to begin with one document from probably up until now the most prolific writer on the subject of African history and that is Joel A. Rogers who fittingly should be called Dr. Joel A. Rogers for the accomplishments he made. I'm viewing him as a historian. You read in my books I, wasn't, I didn't like his personal life but I'm going to deal with his contribution now. Rogers is so heavy in what he writes. Listen to this, this first document Document one. You have it there in your source paper. You can read it with me. The Bible really originated in ancient Egypt, where the population, according to Herodotus and Aristotle, was black. Here, the Jews received almost all of their early culture. Professor Breasted, leading Egyptologist, says <coughs> the right social and moral development of mankind in the Nile Valley, which is 3,000 years older than that of the Hebrews, contributed it essentially to the formation of Hebrew literature. Our moral heritage, therefore, derives from a wider human path, enormously older than the Hebrew, and has come to us rather through the Hebrew than from them. Now, in this one document, brothers and sisters, we have 11 facts. This one document is loaded. The first thing it states is it originated where? It started there. Nowhere else. Now, where is Egypt? Where? You sure about that? We bring up this point because we know that European scholars and and the media people have tried to give us the idea that Egypt was somewhere in the Netherlands, maybe in Hollywood or somewhere, but anywhere, but on the African continent, and that it didn't belong to us. As you look at the map, there it sits right there on the continent. And it was not called Egypt. What was it called? That was one of the names. Let me read. Let me read from Dr. Ben's Black Man of the Nile. Page 3. See what Dr. Ben has to say. We call on you in your testimony, Dr. Ben. Black Man of the Nile, page 3. And I must have the wrong book here. I had the wrong Black Man of the Nile. He has two Black Men of the Nile and his family. And I had the old one that I was reading from. Let me find it here. Hold on just a minute, my brothers and sisters. Okay, I just have to tell you off the top of my head. It is in Black Man of the Nile, the old edition, not the new edition, page three, 
that Dr. Ben speaks of the fact that it was called Kemet Sais Kemet Sais and the name that he favors to Mary. You must understand that we're talking about a civilization, an empire which existed for over 18,000 years. Names change among black people monthly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the language changes. So you can think of over a period of 18,000 years how many different things we call the place where we stayed. The name that has come to stand out um, most for us was strongly suggested to us by the Dean of Scholars, Dr. Chancellor Williams, in The Destruction of Black Civilization, page 68. Let's, let me read that for you a minute. Dr. Williams says to us that the Greeks unwittingly applied the second name of the city of Memphis, of Minis, that was this first pharaoh, of the pharaoh of what they called the first dynasty. There were pharaohs older than that, of course. Memphis, as the Greeks called it, and the name that was given to that city was Egyptos. And they applied the name of the city, Egyptos, and let me spell that out for you here. A I G Y P T O S. They applied that name to the whole country. It was the name of a city. And in the Egyptian language, this Greek word, Egyptos, was he ku ta City of Ta. A city of the god Ta. We're going to talk about this concept as we go on that we are accused of being polytheist. We will uh, uh, talk about the concept of the one god and how it was expressed in so many diverse ways by the African as we move on. But Hukukta, the mansion of the god Ta, or city of the god Ta. At the times it was called the city descended from heaven. So the Greeks called it Egypt. There was no Egypt before the black king from whose name it was directly derived. That's uh, Minis. Before that the country was called Kim. And this is the way Dr. Williams spells it. Or Kimi. or C-H-E-M-I. This indicated the black inhabitants of the country because the land that produced that wealth of produce that enabled ancient Egypt to be the breadbasket of the then known world. Everybody had to look to Egypt to eat. They had to look to you to eat. It came out of that black soil along the Nile. And that is where you get the word what from? Ah, thank you. Everything that you look at traces back to the what? The original black man in some form or fashion. Chemistry. Now the name that we have come to favor in this time by the majority of the scholars in the field of Africanology is the name Kemet. And they have the Kemetan Institute in Chicago, Illinois, which does nothing but study, or do South City, which their emphasis, their main area of emphasis is in that which deals with Egypt, because that's a whole body of knowledge in itself. The very word brings to mind a body of studies which Europeans call Egyptology, which could go on ad infinitum. So let's get out of that and go to the next point now. It originated, therefore, in Kim, or Kemet, Land of the blacks, or people produced of the black soil, is what that means. He says the population, according to Herodotus and Aristotle, now since we brought these names up, I think we better deal with them. Who was Herodotus? He was a Greek historian, misnomered by some as the father of history. Now, naturally, people were recording were recording history long before this because Herodotus appears on the scene between 484 and 425 before the Christian era. We don't say BC, we say BCE. 
before the Christian era. Now Europeans record it as B.C., before Christ. We put before the Christian era because the birthday of Christ is not certain. We'll be talking about it in another of Jesus. Christ was its title. The birthday of Jesus is not certain at all. We will deal with that at another time. And everything that happened after that, we don't call it A.D. Anno Domino in the year of our Lord. We refer to it as C.E. or the Christian era. So I'll be talking a lot about B.C.E. here. Between 484 and 425 B.C.E., there was this Greek named Herodotus who was among the first Europeans to be admitted to come in to ancient Kemet to study. They were not permitted to do that, and that was the beginning of the downfall of the black man's greatness at that time when he allowed that. But he was a world traveler. He traveled all in that area. And he saw the ancient Egypt. He saw them. He didn't guess at it. He saw them. And he said, these are black men. We're going to get into detail on that later on. But not only him, one that didn't particularly care for black people. But at that time, the racism of Europeans hadn't developed to the fine <laughs> manner in which it has, the fine-tuned manner in which it has to this day. Aristotle, who, let me give you the date on him so you can write that down if you wish. Uh, for, uh, 384 to 322, before the Christian era. Aristotle, who went in with Alexander, Misnomer the Great, came into Kemet at one library. There was over <laughs> 700,000 books. Greeks had never seen anything like this in the world. Seven, who has 700,000 books in one library? One! That wasn't all down the Nile now. That was one. You'll see the reason why I'm laying this groundwork. What does this have to do with the Bible? You'll see as we go. I have to lay this groundwork for you. And what they did when they got in there they start, first they start tearing stuff up because they couldn't, they were looking for gold or food or something. Say, hey, wait a minute, Aristotle told Alexander, he said, hold it! They tearing up some stuff. Yeah, we need to come out of the cage. Yes, right. Say, man, stop them. They had burned up most of it, but then what Aristotle could reasonably understand, they stole all they could now. What he could reasonably understand, he trans he took translated into Greek and put the names of his friends on. Yes, Some of these people may not even have existed. And it became known as a body of literature called what? Greek philosophy. No such thing in the world. We're going to go into that in depth later because we're going to study uh, this book too. We're going to study this one, Stolen Legacy. And that's how to show you that either they will destroy it or they will burn it up. Uh, they will destroy it or they'll steal it. That's what I mean. They'll destroy it or they'll steal it. Van Sertima says, Dr. Van Sertima says, after destroying as much of African material as they could and stealing and plagiarizing the rest, they said, y'all ain't never wrote nothing. <laughs> you never did anything. You never built nothing. So we had scripts when no we could write when nobody else could. In one of my books I mentioned in, in African People and European Holidays of Mental Genocide, book two, that there wasn't five kings who could read and write in Europe. When the Moors, it's another period we're going to, had universities all over Spain, France, Italy. So brothers and sisters, we're bringing this back to its perspective. Now, it's another document I want to interject here. One of my favorite little pieces, African history, by uh, Earl Sweeting and uh, Les Edmond. Well illustrated. And on page 11 there, and I'm going to pass it around, please pass it back. <laughs> <laughs> when we speak of the literature of a nation, we mean such literature as may be stored in a library and possessed by individuals. The Egyptians were the first people, the what? First. Of the ancient world who had a literature of this kind, who wrote books 
and <coughs> read books who read writing, who possessed books and loved them. We didn't just have them. We loved them. And their literature, which grew and flourished and decayed with the language in which it was written, was of the most varied character, scientific, secular, and religious. Some of these writings are older than the pyramids. Some are as recent as the time when Egypt had fallen from her high estate and became a Roman province. Between these two extremes lie more than, he says, 5,000 years, but between these two extremes lie more than 18,000 years. The picture here shows a concept of what the library was like. I'm going to start it over here and pass it around. They used what was called a, a scroll. And we're going to talk about that in the next document, how paper was made by the African. But just, i got to stick to the points here, and then we'll sum them up as we go along. The main point of this document that stands out is that this literature, that writing, and the con the, uh, all that began first in Africa, in Kemet, in Egypt. And two scholars, I just mentioned two, we're going to mention a lot of, of what they call the classical scholars, the Greco-Roman scholars, all who which, of which had contact with the Egyptians and described what they saw. Not what they would like for it to be, but what they actually saw. And Aristotle and Herodotus, we're starting off with, said this land of where we first came in contact with these books and this learning in universities was controlled and inhabited by its indigenous, which were what? Can you prove that? We will before we finish today. <laughs> we'll begin. You have to be able to do more than say it. You must be able to prove it. Some of these things, are at the risk of sounding redundant, Dr. Williams said, don't worry about being redundant, brother, because we heard about George Washington so often, that was redundant, yes, that we have come to believe it. Yes, sir. So now, how do you think you're going to state one time facts about black people, and our minds have been averse to that, and we're going to get it that one time. Say, so go ahead, go over it, until it becomes a part of us. So when you leave here today, and tend for your mind to be smoking <laughs> with this. And I, I, this, I love it. It consumes me. It's just such a wonderful treasure. But we were talking about Dr. Van Sertel when we were coming in. He said he got to one point where he said, look, I just can't go no further. I got to stop. It's amazing. We've only, and all that we have now, we've only just begun, just began to study. It goes on to say that the right social and moral outlook on life that is how you behave towards other people because that was recorded do you know the oldest social the social axiom in the world is written in the tombs and pyramids all along the Nile right. from the upper to the lower mm -hmm. or let me change that from the lower to the upper because the map here is upside down mm -hmm. it's supposed to be up the other way but Europeans, to put themselves on the top, reverse the map in geography so that what looks is south was actually north. And that's why they are mystified and say the Nile runs backwards. It does not. The Nile is running correctly. They put the map wrong. <laughs> that is what happened. But well, we're using it like this today because I don't want to confuse you. Now. We're accustomed to seeing it this way. But this is the peak here. This belongs on the top. This axiom, the most basic of African law and morality, was chiseled into stone. You may erase what's written. You may destroy the scrolls. But only time and eternity can erode the stone. And it says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Jesus had to say that or he would not have been qualified as a prophet. It was the oldest statement of moral interrelationship with one person to another in the world. Everything else, the Ten Commandments and everything was based on that basic law. 
that separates man from the beast. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So that right moral concept, this document says 3,000 years. But our studies have taken us back that the original dynasties that we're just learning about, just digging up about, are at least 18,000 years old. It probably goes back even further than that, but I'm scared to do that. Now I'll just stop at 18,000. <laughs> just let it be right there. Sometimes hard for the mind to handle. But the greatest sin you could commit in ancient times was not to do unto your brother and your sister as you would have them do unto you. And in many ways, even in our corrupt state, black people keep thinking that other people are going to treat them right because they know that's the basis of life. Yeah. Not understanding that it wasn't written and carved on other people's temples, that's it was right. carved on theirs. That's right. It wasn't inculcated into them at birth, nor was it taught to them from the cradle or in the womb until they grew up. They didn't have that understanding. So we keep thinking that they're going to treat us like we're supposed to be treated. It's just because they didn't have that basic law. They talk about it, but they were not able to internalize it. We were able to internalize it better because we had it so much longer. So every, every moral precept that you find in the Bible and everything did not come from the Hebrews, but through the Hebrews. I think I have made that point sufficiently. If not, you can ask me more questions. Let's go to the next document. You ready for that one? We'll go to document two now. We're still talking about what question are we answering? Who wrote the Bible? The entire Psalms on document two in your source paper and the Hebrew Christian Torah, I just brought up another word we're going to have to deal with, are reeked with direct copies what kind of copies? Of works written word for word from the African, Egyptian, Nubian, Kushite, you know Dr. Ben, he goes on like that, sayings and teachings. This should not be surprising to anybody since Moses and most of the earliest Hebrews in Genesis and Exodus were all Africans. They were born in Egypt. Even the theory of monotheism, we're going to get into that, the belief of one God above all others was taught in before the birth of Moses. So naturally before the birth of Christ. You're right, brother. That's from Black Man of the Nile, page 72. Dr. Yusef Ben Jochani, who reads Walls. Yes, he does. <laughs> yes, he does. At top speed. Yes, he does. <laughs> we are blessed people to yes, walk the earth with these folks and share the same space with them. Let's get on into this document now. Much of the Old Testament as it appears in today's Bible, the Bible that most black people have in their home, was directly, I got to put emphasis on that word, I must put emphasis on the word, directly copied when Europeans finally learn how to write. I'm not being nasty now. I can prove it historically. I'm not being a racist or nothing. I'm just telling the truth. When they finally learn how to write, they, they copy directly from the ancient writings of African people. And one of the people, although they were not Europeans, they were Hebrews, were a group of Africans. They copied, all right, they copied directly from those ancient writings. Now when one studies the Bible, you must always keep that in mind. You are not reading an original, but you're reading a revision or copy of something more ancient. The basic principles may be there, but when you copy anything, what happens? Something often gets lost in the translation. And this is not an attack on the Bible either, so don't take it that way. I'm trying to put it in its proper perspective. When you pick it up now, don't expect divine light and stuff to come out of it. <laughs> and thunder and lightning to hit you if you question it. Because you're dealing with a book that was handled by humans. Anything handled by humans, no matter where it originates, something happens in the process. 
Now the Psalms, which we're going to talk about later, the favorite book of black people, we're going to talk about in Lesson 4 of Akhenaten. One of his Psalms is direct, word for word, with the 23rd or the 104th Psalm in the Bible. The Torah, let's break that word down. The word Torah means law, and it's the first five books in the Bible, uh, which is Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, and uh, maybe I got them a little bit out of sync. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Yeah, I know that the five of them, but I mean I have them in sync. But you know the first five books is called by the Hebrews in their tradition, the Torah. You ready? Are you ready? All right. Now, are you ready? All right. Now, we've raised another word here that we must deal with. And that word is testament. It comes from a Greek word. Now, I know, uh, I told you this is university level information made, put in everyday words. But don't let none of this back you up. Nothing but language. You spoke them all. You created them all. Dia. C.K. Dia. C.K. Greek is where the word testament comes from. And some may think that the moment that the first book of the Bible, which is believed to be Genesis, was written, they said, okay, let's make this part of the, new, of the Old Testament. They did not, because they didn't even use the word testament back in those days. The word testament was not applied as the Old and New Testament to any of the writings of the Bible until the, this brother need a chair? <laughs> Yes, sir. <laughs> There's one right here. Get his brother chair, please. Make sure that he can come on in here. In uh, 155, you can write these dates down because at the end of this, I'm going to give you a test after we finish this one. That I hope that don't run you all out here. <laughs> but one of your accomplishments is going to have to be your map that you fill in, and the other is your chronology. Your date. So you may be taking them down all kind of ways now, but at the end of seminar one sessions, all the sessions we have, I expect you to hand them to me in sequence. All right, but they were. We're going to, a name comes to mind here, another African in another period, Tertian in 155 uh, of the Christian era, CE. And the other name is Origene. And say, Brother Origen, you were 185 to 254. And uh, Tertullian is 155 to 230. And these are approximate dates of the Christian era. These two African bishops of the original Christian church were the ones who put the appellation or the designation diatheke or testament to the Bible. That's when it started at that time. But nobody knew it in Moses' day or Jeremiah's day or Isaiah's day. They did not call it a testament. The word means diatheke, covenant, contract, or agreement. It was what it means. And to Tertullian and Origen, these early church fathers, they said what we're looking at here in the Old Testament books seems to be an agreement that was made between the Creator, or Yahweh, and the children of Israel at that time. So what we're looking at in these books that they're writing about the life of Jesus and since that period is a new agreement between the Creator and not only Israel but the world. That was their theological concept. No way of proving it. But that's how the word testament came about there. He says here that Moses and all of the other Hebrews were indigenous Africans. We're going to discuss that in detail as we move on here in lesson two. But the thing I really want to give some real uh, attention to is this. The word monotheism. Mono meaning one. Theism meaning God. Greek. We'll discuss later as we go on why you run into so many Greek and Latin words here in this study. Dr. Williams, again, gets into this in the destruction of black civilization about this idea of one God. And we need to stop here and get some thought to it because it is claimed that the Hebrews 
or commonly called Jews, were the first ones to bring the concept of the one God to the world. Historically, that is not correct. Not even Akhenaten, who we'll be talking about later, whom they say, well, he was a couple of hundred years before Moses. He actually did it. No. It's a concept that has existed among Africans from time immemorial. Let me read from page 244 of the Destruction of Black Civilization. Dr. Chancellor Williams, my granddaddy, spiritually, yes, says, there was no problem, he, he uses here, first of all, if I read this statement, this reference, he's using as a study the kingdom of Cuba in the Central Africa. But he says, as using this case study, it is reflective of the attitudes and concepts of a continental Africa of basically all Africans. This is how we felt about religion and God. There was no problem of religious unity in Cuba because there was no problem of religious conflicts in traditional Africa. Where? Traditional. It's only when other people came out, out from outside of Africa with concepts which we had taught them and said you either accept this part of the concept and reject the other or we're going to enslave you or kill you. <coughs> For someone to come into the continent and say, accept Islam or die, was not the African original concept of Islam that was created by Africans. The Prophet Muhammad lived in a land of people who were descended from the Africans. But I'm not going to go into that now. That's another study. <laughs> I'm Bilal, but I'm just touching on that. For anybody to come in with Christianity and religion, we created and say, you either accept our understanding of this, as limited as it is, or you are, you are uh, what did they call you? You are a uh, heathen and are worthy of enslavement. Now, there's no Christian charity there. It's an excuse. <laughs> That's what it is. He said, but there was no religious conflicts in traditional Africa. We could identify with all religious thought because we were the creators of it. The blacks having a common origin and a common center of civilization had the same fundamental religious beliefs throughout the continent, just as all of their other basic institutions were similar. The inevitable variations were insignificant. They didn't care what you call them. The basic concept remained the same. Whatever you want to call it, we get caught up in the name of it when compared with the universal similarities. It was just insignificant. The Cubans believed as all Africans believed in one almighty God, the creator of the universe. There were numerous ways of expressing the one God concept. How many ways? Numerous. About as many ways as you have people on earth. Because people are going to express things how? according to their understanding, what they see, what they experience in their life. Now, people with wisdom understand that. Folks with insecurities don't understand it. So they figure, i got to make you believe my way or else. I've even had some folks say, I think I had in one week, I had one brother, I'm not even going to mention the faith, five different beliefs state to me because I would not accept their belief as they understood it, that I wasn't their brother. I said, now wait a minute. You can't put me out to family. <laughs> he might be identified with the sun and called the sun god, or as a variation of this might be called the sky god. The numerous other gods, far from being in conflict with the great god, were a necessary part of his divine plan. Because he created the sun and the stars and the moon and all. His own deputies and emissaries who had direct charge of the various departments of life that concerned human needs. The earth, water, illness, health, fertility, planting, harvest, the forest, war, hunting, fishing, etc. There was only one creator. As a matter of fact, Africans did not build any temples to the one. That's what they called it, the one. The unmoved one. They didn't build any temple. They built temples to the sun, the sky, everything. They did not worship the sun. Now there are periods in our history where it degenerated into that. But originally the concept was not to worship the sun, 
It was not to worship a fish or to worship the sky or the stars. They merely saw these things as agencies through which the one divine force in the universe for which they had no name. They just said the one. You couldn't name it. For which this is when people get messed up. They try to confine it in their church, in their temple. They're going to take the Lord of the universe and put him right in there, one little space here. He's here. And you want to meet him, you better come in here. Because he cannot be met any other way than me. Well, he's all in the trees. You know, well, the sky. That was the African understanding of things. So if he appeared to worship the fish, he reverenced the fish because that was a fishing village and therefore the Creator supplied their needs through. So their concept of the Creator through was his method of supplying their needs. So they talked to him in terms of fish. They communicated in terms of fish because that's how he communicated with them. Very basic, very simple, nothing complicated about it. So now, we have no reason to argue over our difference of faith with each other, do we? <laughs> Absolutely none. But here's something else that Dr. Williams has to say in the rebirth of African civilization. We're still talking about this here thing that was raised up in this one terminology, raised up in this document, monotheism. Mm -hmm. We go to the rebirth of African civilization. Here it is by Dr. Chancellor Williams. He wrote this one first, actually, after 16 years of study on the continent. And this is what Dr. Williams says on page two of that work. He says, we realized rather early that the first thing to be studied, he said, when we approached the study of African people, and he said, when I first started my work here on the continent, I realized this that we had to study something upon which upon the surface seemed to be entirely unrelated to our task, the African religion. What he's saying here, before you can study anything else about African people, you must study. Religion. Why? For religion turned out to be something more than a subscribed to system of beliefs, but a philosophy and Actual, what kind? Actual. Actual way of life. So you cannot study Africans until you first study that. Because that's what everything they do is based upon. Their way of life, their outlook and concept of life. That is African religion. The very word itself. We're going to do a definition of it as we go on and break that down. But let me get to some more on Dr. Williams, on monotheism. I'm just going to work with this a little more. We'll come back to the point. You all right? Take your time. Take your time. Right. Are we boring you? No, no sir. <laughs> Page 94 of Destruction of Black Civilization. We read. He speaks now of the role of religion again in the African way of life. And this time he speaks of it in the context of the mother of all cities. The mother of all cities it was called, was one of the chief centers of religion in Africa because the blacks were very religious people. It was the city of a hundred gates, the oldest city so far known to the world. Not Rome, not Athens, no, Thebes in the land of the blacks, the oldest city. Known as down below, was it below the fourth cataract, water rapids there on the Nile. Because religions to the Africans was far more than ritual reflecting beliefs, it was more than just going to the church, but a reality reflected in their actual way of life, religion from the earliest times became the dynamic force. That means the what? Driving force in the development of all the major aspects of black civilization. When you look at the pyramids, when you look at the Ramazeum, when you're not only just in Africa, when you go up in England and look at Stonehenge, when you go to South America and see the statues of Quetzalcoatl, this was motivated by a dynamic driving force, and that was the African's religion, his way of life, his indomitable belief 
in the divine force from which he came, commonly known as God of the Creator. It began with him. It didn't start anywhere else. Now, at the risk of being redundant, let me go to another statement from Dr. Williams on page 96. Religion was not only the immediate occasion for the development of art and architecture, but it would also inspire the drive for bigness, the grand design on a scale as huge as human skill and effort could achieve. Nothing was, uh, nothing less was befitting to the gods. This is what religion <coughs> is supposed to be. It is supposed to make you seek after what? The very best. They built like giants. <coughs> they didn't build anything small. Pyramid covers, 13 city blocks. Had to be big. Yes, Had to be the best that could be achieved because that's what their religion required of them. For a moment, as we step outside of history, just for a second, and philosophize for a brief moment, what does that say to us today? Because all this means nothing if we cannot apply it in our day and time. What does that say to you as an individual and to me? It says that we're the best. <laughs> and if we not, our religion and our God demands of us what? That we be that. That we give it our very best. Because anything less is an offense to the one who created us. That is the original concept of African religion. And God. So what we're functioning in the context of today is obviously, and I'm not attacking anything, please. I didn't ask you to come here so I could attack what you, but that's not what I'm about. But we have to put things right. So obviously something is wrong because no people have more churches and religious institutions in their communities than do black people. But then no people have more low life to and filth going on in their community than do black people. So something has to be redirected so that it can bring out the best in us. So that we can reach for the heights. We could never, if we were in tune with God, if we are truly religious and truly in tune with the Creator, we could not accept a ghetto existence. We couldn't. We could not accept slums. We could not throw trash in our streets. Because we know it is demanded of us. That's why Jesse Jackson can stand up and, and say that. That we must be excellent. Because that is the God concept. Well, let me get out of philosophy and back to the history now. <laughs> Page 97. The ancient religion that gave birth to science and learning. Art, engineering, architecture. The resources for a national economy and political control. That same religion was the mother of history. Of writing of music, the healing art, the song, and the dance. Every science goes back to that. As Roger says, no matter what some may think of religion, yeah. it was the source from which all that other learning emanated, came from that. So never excuse it. Now, in closing out on this point of monotheism in the original African religious concept, we have to come back to Dr. Williams again. I love you so much. And he talks about how white people took this concept and began to corrupt it and eventually turn it on us. What, what was good for us, they eventually turned on us. On page 120, and he's talking about here a period which took place in the 22nd dynasty. Don't worry about all the facts and details now on this. It's the idea and principle we're going after here. In the 22nd dynasty, which took place, if you want to write the date down, because I'm probably going to want that in. I'm probably going to want that in your uh, chronology. Uh, 947 to 925. It's when the Asians had come in and we were fighting hard trying to regain that land. Dr. Williams says, besides this struggle we were having with the Asians to make matters worse, from the viewpoint of the blacks, Shishank, this is an Asian, had another son made high priest of the African god Amon. That means he's taking over now. He's going to point who's going to be the high priest. The significance of this should be obvious. 
the whites were systematically preempting the whole of Egypt, even adopting as their own black institutions that which they could not easily destroy. And they were wise enough to see that to control Africans, they would have to gain control of the African religion. So now as the whites became priests and worshippers of the supreme God and lesser gods of the blacks in Egypt, the success of erasing every vestige of early African civilization was moving toward the absolute. You say, why doesn't the black man know about himself? Why has he forgotten his history? Because way back there in 947, between 947 and 925 before the Christian era, they began over what, 2,900 years ago, almost 3,000 years ago, they began the what? The process to erase mm -hmm. from his mind and from history, his true and original place. And the way to do that was now to manipulate and redefine his religion. The first step that had to be made. In short,